Uh, hello, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Andrejcik of the Green Studies Program uh, at the Harriman Institute, Columbia University. Thanks so much for joining us today uh, for a presentation by Leah Batstone entitled Between Serialism and Suprematism, Nikolai Yaroslavitz's Modernist Music. Uh, before we get to today's talk, I just have a quick note. Uh, a week from now, exactly at this time, Thursday at noon, we'll also be having an online event. We'll have a book presentation, which kind of lines up nicely with today's theme, uh, kind of a double header of sorts. Uh, today we'll be talking about music, um, the avant-garde and um, early Soviet period, uh, where next week we'll be talking about visual art of the same period. Miroslav Shkandri will be presenting his latest book, Avant-Garde Art in Ukraine, 19. 10 to 1930, Contested Memory is this book right here. So Miroslav, it's a wonderful book. Uh, so please join us next week for our part two of our little double header here. But uh, today uh, we will be speaking about music and the format is such that our speaker will present and afterwards uh, you'll have a chance to pose questions through Zoom or through YouTube and I'll pass them along to the speaker. Our speaker today, Leah Bastone, is a musicologist and professor of music history at Hunter College City University of New York. Her research concerns the intersection of music and social and political change, with a focus on turn of the century Austria and 20th century Ukraine. Her doctoral dissertation on Gustav Mahler and Friedrich Nietzsche was completed at McGill University in 2019, for which she was awarded a Fulbright Mach Fellowship to Vienna. More on that later. Her research has also been supported by the Tarashevchenko Foundation of Canada and by the Center for the Humanities at the Graduate Center, City University of New York. She has presented at several international conferences, including the International Biennale and North American 19th Century Music Conferences. She serves on the editorial board of Artistic Culture, Topical Issues, which is the journal of the Modern Art Research Institute of the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine. And uh, many, you, many of you may have met uh, Leo uh, as the organizer and participant of the annual Festival of Contemporary Ukrainian Music. Uh, Contem Contemporary Ukrainian Music Festival is the title, which took place uh, in New York uh, this past February, which was a wonderful, wonderful event. Uh, and um, recently, Dr. Bastone received a Marie Skłodowska Curie Action Rewire Fellowship at the University of Vienna to research her book project, whose topic is on Ukrainian art music of the past 100 years. And again, to title of today's talk between serialism and suprematism, Nikolai Yaroslavitz's modernist music. Uh, Leah, please take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me, Mark. Um, I'm very honored to be on a double header with Miroslav Shkandri. As you'll see, I talk about him in my paper. I didn't realize, so that's a, that's lovely, <laughs> a lovely addition. Um, I'm just gonna start my presentation. Before I begin my remarks today, I just want to note that I've written today's paper for a general audience, familiar with Ukrainian history, but not necessarily with musical history or techniques of musical analysis. So we'll provide some explanation as I go about some of the compositional details of Roslovet's work, hopefully without getting too much into the weeds for non-musicians in the audience. So just disclaimer there. Nikolai Roslovets was, according to the famed musicologist Richard Taraskin, quote, a Russian composer. Shostakovich scholar Pauline Fairclough has referred to Roslovets as a homegrown Russian dodecophonist. Even Anna Ferenc, a theorist and early proponent of Roslovets' music, gives him the title of Russian modernist. As these quotations show, the composer has been primarily discussed in Russian terms. Indeed, he was an important figure of the avant-garde aesthetic of the early Soviet Union, he was trained in Moscow and his birthplace stands at the border where Belarus, Ukraine and Russia meet now a part of the Russian Federation. However, given recent laudable trends in music research, 
that aim to reconsider histories told from the imperial perspective, putting narratives back in the hands of socially marginalized groups. The time to consider Ukrainian composers in terms of their relationship to Ukraine, an area of scholarship sorely underexplored by English language scholars, has come. Scholarship on Ukraine's cultural history in the fields of literature, visual arts, theater, and film has moved more swiftly to identify particular Ukrainian elements than writing in the field of musicology. Nonetheless, a history of music not just in Ukraine, but of Ukraine, awaits excavation. Building upon the recent work on Ukrainian modernism of the early 20th century in adjacent humanities fields, I will use my time today to consider what might be viewed as a particularly Ukrainian facet and tendencies of the music of Nikolai, or perhaps Mikola Roslovets. By triangulating the composer's contributions amidst musical developments of his contemporaries, Alexander Skriabin and Arnold Schoenberg, as well as developments in the broader world of Ukrainian fine art and literature, I hope to begin to stake out a new narrative that allows Ukrainian composers the complexity of identity and innovation that their works deserve. Roslovets was born in Dushatin, in the Saraj region of now a part of Russia's Bryansk Oblast. However, the Chernihiv Gobernia, where Saraj was located during Roslovets' life, was not a monolithically Russian part of the empire. Census data from 1897, when Roslovets would have been 16, shows that the oblast as a whole was 66% Ukrainian, and that the county of Saraj was itself predominantly Belarusian. Roslovets own account of the location of his upbringing was as a half Ukrainian, half Belarusian town. At the age of 12, he moved to Konotop, a small Ukrainian city in the region that was originally settled by Cossacks in the 17th century and was the site of several struggles between Cossack forces and Muscovite ones. He finished his elementary studies in Kursk, leaving for Moscow for the first time at the age of 21. Following his conservatory studies, Roslovat set out on a path to develop a new tonal language in his music, which flourished during the 1910s and which he continuously refined during, throughout the 1920s. Like many early 20th century composers, Roslovets felt that the traditional harmonic system in which the seven notes of a major or minor scale dictate not only the pitches available to the composer, but a hierarchical relationship between them had reached its full potential. Roslovets' compositions increasingly tended towards the use of what he called synthetic chords as a replacement for traditional tonality. In his autobiography, the composer wrote about this system, saying that certain independent, self-sufficient sound complexes, synthetic chords, served as the basis for a, for a composition's entire harmonic scheme. In the composition's overall constructive scheme, he wrote, these synthetic chords, which included six to eight or more sounds from which the majority of chords that exist in the old harmonic system are easily constructed, were obviously supposed to play not only an external sound color role, but also an internal role as substitutes for tonality. Roslovet's synthetic chord system is similar to post-tonal theory's concept of set class. The pitches of the same set class are transposed by different intervals or means, and as the music theorist Inessa Bazayev has shown in Roslovet's works, these transpositions often occur at distances of perfect fits. Bazayev has also contributed several detailed analysis of how certain synthetic chords function as the organizing principle at the core of Roslovet's compositions, including his 1914 work Pianissimo. In the accompanying slide, Bazayev has identified the pitches that make up the work's organizing synthetic chord. And these are A sharp, B, C sharp, D, E flat, E sharp, and F sharp. The starting point of this set is then transposed throughout the work while maintaining the same intervallic relationship between the notes of the original synthetic chord. For those who are unfamiliar with the concept of set class theory, I will just offer a brief example. And I'm very grateful, let me say, to um, Dr. Bazayev for a uh, presentation that she gave at the festival this year and for this musical example, which she has given me permission to use as an illustration. The original version of the synthetic chord is referred to as set zero. Rather than work with the complexities of letters to identify pitches, which can have many enharmonic equivalents depending on key and function, these letters are substituted for numbers between zero and 11 representing the 11 pitches of the chromatic scale, the 12 pitches of the chromatic scale. 
in order, um, in other words, all the black and white keys of a single octave on the piano. What we see in Bazayev's example is that Roslovets, while maintaining the same intervallic relationship between pitches, creates interest and variety by beginning his synthetic chord in different places, so on pitches other than A sharp. So set minus six begins instead on E, but the relationships of the pitches within the set to each other is exactly the same as the original. This approach to composition takes the organizing principle away from a sense of tonic key stability, but allows the work a different logic that unifies its content in other ways. And to illustrate that, I'd like to play a little bit of this piece, Pianissimo, which is the second of three etudes by Vassalats. Sorry, that started over. It was supposed to just be heard once and stop, but has a mind of its own. So there, there is a kind of logic to the piece. It's not a harmonic, functional harmonic um, logic that we're used to that is built upon sort of traditional concepts of tension and resolution, but the piece is sort of unified by this um, synthetic chord model that is, you know, throughout, that dictates throughout the, the pitches that are used and their relationship to one another. During the period of Roslovet's greatest success and popularity in the early 1920s, he returned to Ukraine in order to teach at the Musical Institute in Kharkiv, the newly established capital of the Ukrainian SSR. It was during this period that he also wrote a number of significant prose works and journal articles about new systems of music and their suitability to a revolutionary proletarian aesthetic. In particular, Roslovets became an early champion of the music of Viennese composer Arnold Schoenberg. In 1923, he published an insightful essay on the melodrama Piero Lunaire, one of the first and most important atonal works of the 20th century. More on that in a moment. This championship and the similarities between his synthetic chord system and Schoenberg's concept of serial composition earned him the moniker, the Russian Schoenberg. Russian, once more. Alas, as was so frequently the case, it did not take long for the tides to turn against Roslovets. 
And in 1929, he was the subject of a severe criticism by the Russian Association of Proletarian Music or the RIPM. In 1930, he escaped increasing restriction by moving to Tashkent in Uzbekistan where he focused his efforts on writing music that captured Uzbek folk song and completed the first Uzbek opera. Roslovets returned to Moscow in 1933 where he worked mostly under the radar, limiting his use of the controversial atonal system he had pioneered a decade earlier. After suffering a crippling stroke in 1939, the composer died in 1944 after a second attack. In addition to his identification almost exclusively as Russian by those few commentators who examined Roslovat's life, his musical works themselves are frequently discussed in connection to the work of Alexander Scriabin, a Russian composer occupied with the aesthetics and concepts of symbolism and theosophy. Like Roslovat, Scriabin sought out a new form of composition that extended beyond the limitations of traditional tonality established in the preceding centuries. Over the course of his fairly short career, he died at the age of 43, Scriabin's compositional style became increasingly chromatic and dissonant, reaching its apex with the invention of his mystic chord. Used extensively in the symphonic poem Prometheus, the famous collection of tones is by definition a synthetic chord, and this has facilitated comparison of the two composers. The composers are linked not only by similar compositional elements, but also aesthetic inclinations. Like Scriabin, Roslovets was also interested in figures of the symbolist movement. He frequently set, music, uh, set to music the texts of Russian symbolist poets of the Silver Age, particularly the more mystical work of Alexander Bloch, to whose memory he had also dedicated a three song cycle setting the poetry of another poet and Pavlovich. Other works include the settings of poetry by Ihor Severyanin, Zenaid Yehipius, and Valery Brusov. While certain narratives suggest that Roslovet's interest in symbolism serves as evidence of the dominant influence of Scriabin, the older and more famous Russian composer, an examination of trends of Ukrainian modernism suggests another interpretation. In the realms of visual art, the influence of symbolism on Ukrainian modernism has been explored by Miroslava Mudrak, whose recent article in the Harvard Ukrainian Studies Journal is devoted to the topic. Mudrak's essay surveys various strands of artistic symbolism in Ukraine, from the work of Mikhailo Zhuk through, the, through David Berlyuk's de depictions of Kozak Mamai to the mystical symbolism of Maria Sinyakova and briefly Kazimir Malevich. Mudrak writes, quote, symbolism accorded Ukrainian artists a way of pioneering their own circuitous and conventional as it may have been way towards artistic modernism. As they appropriated the new visual language from Western counterparts or their imperial cultural overseers, they reshaped its lexicon and syntax to fit the internal socio-political realities of the day, end quote. Among its uses, symbolism in Ukraine was frequently preoccupied with elevating an ancient past and celebrating the rural present, accompanied by allusions to Orthodox iconography and Eastern theology. Although it's almost impossible to find recordings of Roslovet's settings of symbolist poetry, a project I'm working to correct with some assistance of some New York City-based singers, the topics of the works he chose to set frequently aligned with these aims, especially the celebration of nature. And here's just a selection of some of the poetry that he set and in black are um, songs that speak specifically to nature themes that are very often found, I think, in Ukrainian um, literature and art. While the rec recordings of his vocal works are not easy to locate, the concept of musical symbolism can be heard in Roslovet's early instrumental works in a form similar to that of Debussy, French contemporary, also heavily influenced by symbolist poetry. In the following excerpt, like symbolist poetry, the shape and logic of the music is dictated not by harmonic progressions of tension and resolution, but rather of sounds that are in themselves evocative and affecting. The work, whose programmatic title derived from the genre popular, popularized by Frédéric Chopin, is Roslevet's Nocturne for oboe, harp, two violas, and cello, written in 1913. And I'm just going to play an excerpt beginning, not at the beginning, because the beginning has sort of a slow introduction, um, but beginning at rehearsal A.
more personal connection further ensnares Roslovet's interest in symbolism to the tradition of Ukrainian modernism. Those familiar with the work of painter Kazimir Malevich may have recognized the sites of Roslovet's adolescence mentioned earlier. In fact, the composer and painter grew up together, first in Konotop and then Kursk, when both families were moved as part of their employment for the Moscow K and Voronezh Railway Administration. The two young men were much more than neighbors, developing their early artistic languages in one another's company. In one of Malevich's recollections, the artist wrote, quote, my life in Kursk flowed tirelessly over my work on painting, while Koyo Roslovets developed his work along musical lines. According to the painter Ivan Kuhn in 1908-09, Malevich, quote, painted several symbolist and mystical pictures. A painting entitled Songs to Blue Clouds depicted a naked man, composer Roslovets, playing a violin, at the top are blue clouds and not far away are a few stylized trees. Alexander Shatsky writes, evidently Malevich heard his friend playing in nature more than once for both the violin's melody sounded like a pantheistic song to the blue clouds. So the completed painting has been lost, but this is a sketch that survives. Malevich would become more than just a childhood friend sharing an early interest in symbolism. Instead, the aesthetics pioneered by these two men chart in interesting and revealing ways. Returning to Mudrak, she writes, quote, we should read the episodes of symbolist practice as stepping stones to an independent aesthetic and worldview that would manifest itself as a consolidated effort only in the 1920s. End quote. This is just as true of the world of fine arts as it is of Roslovet's musical output and can be used and can be useful to track the composer's relationship through Malevich. Roslovet's adolescent collaborations with Malevich grew into professional alliances as both men turned toward an increasingly revolutionary aesthetic. In 1916, following the publication of Black Square, Malevich wrote to the painter and composer Mikhail Matyushin about starting the journal Supremus to extol the values of the suprematist movement in the fields of, quote, painting, decorative art, music, and literature. Among the names of those people honest to art, as Malevich identified them, was a single composer, Nikolai Roslovets. In the first issue, Roslovets' essay on non-objective art appeared prominently as the second entry of the journal's contents. I'll just point out that Malevich published his suprematist manifesto in 1927 under the very similar title, the non-objective world. I would ask you to consider the suggestion that the revolutionary approach to the basic materials of composition in the work of both Roslovets and Malevich may be connected to some degree under this concept of suprematism. Suprematism, centering upon the supremacy of pure artistic feeling rather than a representation of specific objects is something I think can be traced in the work of both men. Musical styles of the 20th century are often discussed in connection to visual arts movements in close proximity. Debussy and the French Impressionists, Stravinsky and Primitivism, the Second Viennese School, and Austro-German Expressionism. Given the close friendship and professional alliance between Malevich and Roslovets, their revolutionary aesthetics bear comparing. Malevich's canvases evolved from obvious representations of people and places to the abstract combination of shapes and color with which he's most closely associated. Here's a comparison of two of his own self-portraits, one very clearly um, suprematist and the other not. Um, by rejecting the tradition of imitation and representation rooted in Renaissance ideals of painting, Malevich created something completely original, freed from the culturally ingrained expectations of fine art. Roslovets developed his increasingly avant-garde approach to composition around the same time, describing his synthetic chord system for the first time in 1913. His desire to replace traditional concepts surrounding tonality and tonal harmony, which also began to take root in musical culture during the late Renaissance, appended listener expectations in order to create works that were entirely new in their content and expression. Just as we have come to a cultural agreement that certain shapes and colors are representative of birds or sky or sea, even without sound, smell, movement, or three dimensions, the, the system of tonal harmony has trained listeners to associate certain intervals with tension and resolution and certain scales with particular moods, bright and happy, sad and somber, exotic and beguiling. Both Malevich and Roslovets rejected these conventions and utilized forms of pure materials to construct new works, whether those were particular geometric shapes in the case of Malevich or collections, set collections of pitches and intervals 
not dictated by traditional concepts of tonal harmony in the music of Rosslevats. While, geograph while geographical and intellectual proximity encouraged the view that the aesthetic developments of Rosslevats and Malevich were related, Rosslevats's approach to music was also significantly influenced by innovations from outside Eastern Europe. Like many Ukrainian modernists, he not only looked east to the art collectives of Moscow and St. Petersburg, but also west to the pioneering developments of classical music in Europe. For Roslovets, the Austrian composer Arnold Schoenberg's rejection of tonal practice was pivotal and became the subject of some of his most important prose writings. In relation to a facets of a Ukrainian brand of modernism, noteworthy is not just his interest in the ideas of Schoenberg, but the way in which he framed his interests as part of a revolutionary agenda. As I said earlier, some background information about Schoenberg and the impact of his compositions may be helpful here. Born in Vienna in 1874, Arnold Schoenberg was responsible for the development of atonal and later 12-tone or dodecaphonic composition of the early 20th century. His early work showed the influence of late romantic composers like Richard Strauss and Gustav Mahler, but he, like Roslovats, came to view the use of a tonal system in which a piece of music is anchored by a home pitch as obsolete. He sought to liberate all 12 chromatic pitches of the octave and to write music that did not privilege the importance of any single pitch over any other. When he found that his early atonal or what he called pantonal compositions in which it composed uh, fell short of his emancipatory goals, he developed the 12 tone method of composition in which a composer must use all of the 12 chromatic pitches of the octave once before returning to any a second time, thereby ensuring an equal treatment of all tones. Like Roslevet's synthetic chords, these arrangements of pitches were given numbers rather than letters and offered as a 12 tone row or set, which was then used in various transpositions and manipulations. Roslevet's essay on Schoenberg's first important atonal work, Piro Lunaire, a melodrama of 21 short pieces setting the poetry of Albert Giraud, makes revealing statements about Roslevet's thinking about his own compositional aesthetics. He characterizes Schoenberg's innovations as, quote, revolutionary, breaking all bonds and blazing a new trail. And he relates Schoenberg's response to the crisis of tonality as a Nietzschean revaluation of values. The use of such a phrase implies that for Roslevets, Schoenberg's contributions to the trajectory of musical development were as significant and revolutionary as the philosopher's suggestion that our entire system of morality should be rightly turned on its head. Indeed, he writes that with Pierrot Lunaire, Schoenberg was confidently and boldly overturning the century old concept of musical beauty. In order that we might find ourselves on the same page as Roslevets, I'd like to play a short excerpt from one of the 21 pieces from Pierrot Lunaire. And this is a melodrama, so it is not always performed with an actor or, or it's not always staged. Um, the singer is not always dressed up and, and acting, but it is, they are in this example. So I, I think that's particularly helpful. While the boldness of the innovations pioneered by Schoenberg are apparent to any regular listener of classical music, the language that Roslovets used to describe the Viennese composer's contributions is particular in its identification with this process as a form of revolution. 
contrasting Schoenberg's compositional style to the poetic style of Giraud, not even a generation earlier, Schoenberg is held up as the promising proletarian future. And here I quote an extended passage from his essay, from Roslevet's essay. Indeed, alongside the sophisticated, refined, impressionist Giraud, an esteet to the marrow of his bones with a sensual delight that relishes in the ephemeral poetic image, the flower of his sick, sated fantasy, we have his antithesis, Schoenberg, a revolutionary nature, healthy and exuberant, a man of disciplined intellect and iron will with a psychic attitude that is the polar opposite of Impressionism, creating an artistic tendency alien to Impressionism. And Roslevetz continues, the image of Pierrot, as he is presented to us in the music of Schoenberg, is not a loony, ghostly Pierrot with his delicate sighs that seem to infuse the wispiest harmonies of Debussy, but a reinforced concrete Pierrot, a child of the contemporary industrial city, a giant, a new Pierrot as yet unknown to humanity, in whose sighs is heard the clang of metal, the whir of propellers, and the howl of automobile sirens. True, this Pierrot of Schoenberg's is also ensnared by the effect of the light, but the source of the energy of the light here is certainly not the moon, but a powerful electric projector. It is not surprising that given Roslevet's political beliefs and the time in which he lived, that his orientation would have been towards the aesthetics that upheld a new social as well as artistic system. This, however, provides a link between Roslevet's music and a particularly Ukrainian form of modernism that has been discussed by Miroslav Shkandri. Shkandri notes that the eager absorption of any and all revolutionary aesthetics was particularly widespread in Ukraine, with many members of the Ukrainian avant-garde appearing prominently on the front lines of revolutionary artistic shifts. Shkandri credits this enthusiasm to the change, enthusiasm for change to the country's own experience of the dual revolutions of socialism and national liberation in the early 20th century, as well as years at the hands of imperial oppressors. He writes, quote, the combined revolution strengthened the conviction that the citadels of reaction required toppling and that artists were free to borrow from an entire spectrum of liberationist currents in exploring their visions of the new, end quote. Roslevet's fervent advocacy for the innovations of Schoenberg demonstrates an impulse to embrace any style or method linked to an aesthetic of liberation from the old system that might rightly be characterized in this time and place, Kharkiv in the early 1920s as a Ukrainian aesthetic. Particularly illustrative of this is the coincidence of technique and topic in the composer's 1928 symphonic poem, Komsomolya, one of the last works composed before his exile in Tashkent. What might appear at first glance as a propaganda piece designed to attract young people to the Komsomols is in fact one of Roslevet's most complex and modernist works. The single movement piece for orchestra and choir is an avant-garde combination of a huge late romantic orchestral apparatus accompanied by wordless choral layers, a surging brass driven cacophony that is largely an uneasy ride, only approaching a semi-triumphant conclusion in the final minutes. And I just want to play a little bit of this. <laughs>
A full analysis of the piece is still wanting. And as I developed this project, I plan to undertake a detailed musical guide for all the work's many moving parts. But despite this lacuna, the setting of such revolutionary music to a celebration of the specific ideological purpose reveals a fleeting artistic moment when aesthetic experimentation was aligned with the new political apparatus. Unlike later works by Soviet composers in which hints of dissidence and resistance have been traced, Roslovet's writings, musical and otherwise, demonstrate a commitment to a revolutionary ideology that had not yet been corrupted beyond recognition. The composer even went so far as to criticize the works he thought were overly simplistic and dumbing down, accusing composers of the Russian Association of Proletarian Music of misunderstanding the proletarian class in his 1926 essay on pseudo-proletarian music. Although Roslovets had been at the forefront of the new revolutionary music for a revolutionary republic, a distinguished representative of the Association for Contemporary Music, the rise of the rival Russian Association of Proletarian Music, RA, RAPM, following Lenin's death changed the tides. Roslovets' assimilation of Western avant-garde idioms was not appreciated nor tolerated by those who soon rose to power within the Soviet Composers Union. Beginning in 1926, Roslovets engaged in a war of words with other composers through the press, one in which he ultimately lost. The Roslovets case, as it was called, was led by a group of composer contemporaries and resulted in a professional boycott of Roslovets and his works as punishment for what was deemed his cosmopolitan style. While his innovations at the cusp of new music did not ultimately serve him, I'd like to suggest that the sources of inspiration that shaped his compositional output reveals his music to be a specimen of Ukrainian modernist music of the revolutionary period and continue to be characteristics of composers of avant-garde music in Ukraine today. As I've discussed in other forums, the concert programming of Ukraine's contemporary classical music ensembles has revealed Ukraine to be a space for mediating the works of artists from East and West and engaging trends at the forefront of new music. For the National Symphony Orchestra of Ukraine in Kyiv, these efforts include concerts of Ukrainian composers that have shifted dramatically from historical figures such as Berezovsky and Beatoshinsky towards living composers, including Valentin Silvestrov, Sviatoslav Lunyov, Volomodir Runchak, and others. The orchestra has also positioned itself as a kind of mediator of international music. Since 2014, it has regularly programmed concerts in collaboration with the embassies or other diplomatic institutions of various countries. The earliest of these partnerships occurred between Ukraine and Europe's most important musical centers, Italy, France, and Germany. But during the past two seasons, Kiev has expanded these par partnerships to provide exposure for the repertoires of Ukraine's neighbors. And most recently, these are Azerbaijan and Poland. Many composers from Ukraine have been educated in Western Europe only to return to Ukraine to pioneer developments of new music. These figures range from the doyen of Ukrainian electronic music, uh, electronic music, Ala Zahakevich, to the recent operatic successes of Roman Grigoriev and Ilya Rozumeko, who's based in Vienna, and whose opera Gaz had its premiere in New York last year. Their newest opera, Chornobyl Dorf, will premiere at the Matetsky Arsenal on October 31st and November 1st. Ukrainian conductor Oksana Liniv can herself be seen as an exemplar of Ukrainian music's bridge between East and West through her past appointments in Graz at both the opera and the Philharmonic, and the recent historic announcement that she will become the first woman to ever conduct at the Bayreuth Festival of Richard Wagner's music. She remains the director of the recently established Lviv Mozart Festival, which combines all genres of classical composition from the work of Mozart's son, Franz Xaver, who spent his life in Lviv, to the newest electronic and contemporary compositions of Ukrainian composers. I'd like to return for a moment to the phenomenon of Roslovet's identification as Russian discussed at the start of this paper. Although clearly in dialogue with members of the Russian symbolist and futurist movements like Malevich, I believe that Roslovets maintained an artistic identity that was formed by a particular Ukrainian heritage and that this can be seen by looking at broader commentaries on Ukrainian modernism written by scholars in the fields of the visual arts and literature. More than biographical details, it is Roslovets' artistic outlook that demonstrates an alignment with the style and development of modernism in Ukraine. The artistic tendencies that I contend link Roslovets more compellingly to a Ukrainian musical culture can be located both in the composer's own works and his published discussion of musical innovation, which required the destabilization of what Maria Sanovitsky has called 
quote, Russia's near monopolistic control over narratives of Ukrainian past and present. The history of Ukrainian art music has yet to be written in terms that can help decipher the, the country's unique contributions. However, greater study of the symmetries between musical developments and innovations in the areas of the humanities that have more concretely staked out a distinctly Ukrainian narrative can help parse a space for Ukraine in the history of classical music. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leah, for a very, very informative and uh, visually and musically very uh, fascinating uh, presentation of this not very well-known uh, musician, Roslavitz. Um, we are opening up uh, two questions from, from the public now. I do have a few of my own I'd like to start with. Uh, you mentioned this uh, Ukrainian modernism and, and symbolism through, through Mudrak as being uh, aligned with the composer's work. Uh, I'm interested also in this period <clears throat> uh, in Ukrainian history, in Ukrainian culture, um, roughly 1917-1921 during the Ukrainian National Republic and then the following governments was quite a chaotic time in Kiev then. But many uh, important things were established for Ukrainian education and culture. Uh, most importantly, the idea of these, these institutes, right, uh, that were set up that ended up lasting through the Soviet Union. Um, I have in mind the Lysenko Music and Drama School, mm -hmm. uh, Ukrainian Republican Kapella, individuals such as Leontovich and Stetsenko. So when you mentioned this connection with uh, Ukrainian modernism, symbolism, the connection was more, you mentioned, I think, Zhuk and more visual arts, right, through, right. through Miroslav's work. Was there any linking at all with some of the musical uh, achievements that were made uh, in Ukrainian music with, with the you know, mentioned composers and institutes, or was there more of an kind of avant-garde break uh, from them? Any linkages, any connections at all? Uh, yeah, this is something that I, I'm eager to look into more. Um, my impression, you know, comparing the work of someone like Leontovich to the work of Roslavets and also someone like Alexander Mosolov, who's also talked about in Russian terms, but had connections to Ukraine, um, is that there was a really different kind of aesthetic going on and that some of these composers were, you know, very much tied to a kind of revolutionary agenda. I mean, that didn't end up working out for them um, and didn't end up working out in general, but that, that in their music, they were looking to do sort of the newest, most cutting edge things possible. And I, I guess I don't think of Lantovich as sort of falling into that category. Um, and it will be interesting to see what, if any, you know, overlap between musicians potentially in Kharkiv, like at the Institute where Roslovets was based, where he sort of started things going. Um, if, if there was any sort of intersection or if these two groups were sort of composing in their own worlds. Um, but thank you for the suggestion. I, yeah, I, and I, and I had in mind, not just, you know, it could have been a rejection, you know, a lot of right. these polemics were quite fiery then and, you know. <laughs> Uh, so that was just interesting if they were acknowledged at all in, in a positive or, or negative way. And which leads to kind of a follow-up question. Uh, when you think of, of, and we've talked about, you know, visual art and symbolism, Ukrainian, and then, but how about like on the literature side? Uh, I, I'm wondering if there ever was any contact with Roslavitz and uh, let's say the main Ukrainian futurist, Mikhail Semenko which would obviously be a little bit more aligned with uh, some of the avant-garde aesthetic. Uh, and of course, Simon Ko, you know, in the late uh, 20s, based in Kharkiv, was publishing in his journal, Nova Generatia, all, all these articles by Malevich. Uh, so I would think there'd be some kind of uh, meaning or connection between, have you come across any connection between Simon Ko and Roslovitz. No, not not between them. I mean, there are connections between Roslovets and, you know, a whole school of futurists and symbolist poets, some of whom are Ukrainian, but are often kind of lumped into a discussion of just the Russian futurists. I think about the Berlyuk brothers, also Voloshin. Um, 
and Russell that set definitely set some of those texts. Um, but I haven't found that particular connection. And again, that would be, you know, this is, this is something that I really hope to kind of uh, excavate as I, as I get more into this project. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And of course you think of also in this context and I, I, I don't want to keep talking about the same thing, but I, and I understand you're going to look into it, but you know, listening to your talk and you think of people like Les Curbas, right. And you think of the connections also, uh, Born in, born in Ukraine, studied in Vienna, mm -hmm. and comes back uh, to Kiev, revolutionizes Ukrainian theater. Um, yeah. Also, you know, then moves to Kharkiv. So it's just interesting that if, if at all these paths were crossed, oh, maybe not, but it, you know, just kind of things that pop up. Uh, I have another question also. Um, is there any reason, if, if you learned why Roslovitz was rehabilitated so late in the uh in the soviet um, times in other words you know you had post stalin you had rehabilitation of uh of certain writers and composer cultural figures but i believe he was not rehabilitated until like 1990 uh it, it, and this reminds me of kind of like Khrydovi in in ukrainian uh literature also from the 1920s where you know a lot of his colleagues already been rehabilitated but he was you know, one of the last, is there a particular reason why he was so feared and hated that he was so, uh, like, you know, rehabilitated so late? Yeah, I mean, I think that his contribution to something like atonality took a long time to find a space, even in a post-Stalin Soviet Union. Um, so Ina, Ina Sabazayev has actually just written an article about kind of the history of atonality in the Soviet Union and the process by which it was sort of yeah, rehabilitated, reintroduced. And I think that, that that is part of it, that it was, you know, not just ideologically at odds with the apparatus, but it was this new and kind of difficult music. And, and people still, I think, often find, you know, atonal music, Schoenberg's music difficult. And so, you know, it, it had kind of multiple hurdles to overcome. And then it wasn't until much later that someone thought, you know, we should really talk about like the history of this compositional technique in the Soviet Union because it didn't not exist, but it took a long time for that to be sort of acceptable mm -hmm. uh, part of the narrative, I think. Very interesting. Uh, okay, we have a comment from YouTube here from Armando Sorizano. Question is, is there an affinity between non-objective aesthetics and Marxist theory? as in critique of commodity fetishism and reification? Um, <laughs> I think, yes, that there probably is. I've seen a few writings on Roslovet's music that have connected him to Marxist aesthetics. Um, and that happens to be something I am also very interested in, uh, kind of the history of Marxist aesthetics through Ukraine, um, because I think often it's just sort of like brushed aside as like, well, that was a Russian thing. And, you know, I don't think that that's true to the history. Um, you know, music, I don't know. So like Trotsky believed that, um, you know, there was no such thing as kind of a proletarian art, that like art and music, just they existed and what you, you know, they weren't sort of related in any way to kind of the ideology of communism. Um, and it's hard to think about how exactly I think the depiction of very, specific things either in art or in music specific depictions allusions to objects or you know locations um that 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 could be tied to to kind of a capitalist worldview i mean certainly the history of of harmonic you know harmonic functionality is has built in certain very powerful responses in listeners. And we still see those things being utilized, um, you know, to all different ends, including I'm sure to get people to buy things um, in contemporary society. But I think I, yeah, I, I don't think it's quite as, as connected. I don't think it's quite as, you know, 
rejecting any sort of clear depiction as a kind of rejection of capitalism. I think I think there's a little bit more nuance and <clears throat> in Russell that's discussion of this pseudo proletarian music, he is very clear that, you know, any and all kind of musical experimentation should be open to kind of the proletarian class, mm -hmm. and not that only specific ideological musics should be. So I'm not sure that's like, good food for thought. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, our own Alexander Turek has a question, somewhat related, how do Roslovitz's orchestration and instrumentation choices not only and not only rejection of traditional tonality how do they tie into the revolutionary narrative so i mean he wrote a pretty wide spectrum of wrote in a pretty wide spectrum of genres from chamber works solo works for instruments to vocal works to um, a few sort of large-scale orchestral works including the um, symphonic poem that i played and i think in that particular piece especially. There's a lot of utilization of things like percussion, um, which I wouldn't say is necessarily going beyond what composers before him have done. I, I mean, it's hard to, to put an innovation in, in the world of percussion that goes beyond what Mahler did, but it's utilized in a very revolutionary way. So I think of, even in the passage that I played, this kind of beautiful lyrical moment that that's interrupted by the voices chanting, and there's this kind of sound of a kind of mechanical repetition and I think, um, you know, a more in-depth conversation of that uh, that type of composition um, has has gone on around Mosolov's The Iron Foundry. Um, but I think that there are some things like that happening in this particular piece. And even though it's not specific, there are these kind of allusions to community, um, you know, the group voice, um, to the sounds of the industrial city I and mean, Russell that's himself identifies those things when he talks about Schoenberg he's clearly searching for a very <laughs> particular interpretation of what Schoenberg's doing which is connected to kind of this new worker society um the the pieces that are more on a small scale I mean the only thing that strikes me is that they are sometimes an unusual instrumentation so for instance the nocturne which is harp oboe two violas and cello I mean, it's a very strange quintet um, and Schoenberg did very similar things in Piero Lunaire. His, um, you know, his composition was for a set of instruments that were then combined in different ways for each particular song. And in the example we saw, there was violin and cello, I think, and bass clarinet. And, you know, again, these kind of like, there's no label for that type of ensemble, whereas we have this long tradition of piano trios and string quartets and things like that. Um, so I think there, that is maybe just like a little a little bit, a little bit of revolution, but it's sort of this, you know, breaking the rule, sort of who says that it needs to be this arrangement of instruments. So. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dora Kumiak has a broader question. Where, where do you plan to look to find things to ex excavate? Are there raw materials in archives in Ukraine or elsewhere? So you, your research, how active, part two of the question, how active are your academic colleagues in Ukraine in studying this topic? Is this brand new topic? Are you the one uh, leading this uh, this avenue of, of, of investigation? Uh, um, work with? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are a few English language scholars that have looked at Roslovets and um, are looking at kind of Ukrainian topics in general. I would say that it's pretty underrepresented in um, English scholarship, but I can think of a handful of people, including Inessa Bazayev, who, whose examples I showed and who has published a number of, of essays about Russell Vets. If you are interested, I recommend her work. She, it's very technical. Um, I will be looking at scores. I will be looking for um, archival documents that maybe haven't been included in previous um, versions of the biography. Um, a number his biography has sort of changed around, which makes me think that different people have been selective about what kinds of things they include or don't include. And there is an archive of his in Russia, um, which I hope I will get a chance to go to. Um, I don't think any of his compositions are in Vienna, but a number of his colleagues' compositions, Joseph Koffler and I think Mosolov as well, there are archival scores in the um, National Library the Austrian National Library archives. 
Um, so those are some of the things I'm hoping to look at. And I will be looking to see if I can find any Ukrainian language publications about him because it would be very interesting to see what Ukrainian scholars have said about him from a Ukrainian perspective. I mean, you can certainly find, find things written by Russian scholars, which of course place him in a Russian context. Um, but, you know, searching out any, any information sort of from the inside. Um, and that's actually how I stumbled across this topic. I was in Ukraine doing research for the festival um, and on a more contemporary topic. And I was speaking with a journalist who sort of said, oh, well, you know, that Vasilets is Ukrainian, right? And, and so seeing if there's more information down that sort of line of, of research, you know, what have Ukrainians said about the Ukrainianness of Vasilets? Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> Dora also has a question. Uh, do you have a playlist of music to listen to online uh, that illustrates the themes you raised in your talk today? I mean, I know you can listen to Roslovitz's music uh, online, but would you be willing to share a Spotify playlist? I actually got this question from someone else recently. So it is on my to-do list, actually. As soon as I get off this call, I'll go and make my Spotify playlist. Some of these pieces aren't on Spotify. Um, Kom Samoya, for instance, I only found on YouTube. Um, most of the Rosalette's pieces are piano works. Those are the things that have been recorded. Um, none of the songs I've been able to find and they're beautiful. So like I said, I'm, I'm hoping to kind of rectify that. Um, but yes, I would be willing to put together a playlist um, to the extent that I can find things on, on Spotify that I think are important for sort of a 20th century Ukrainian art music perspective. Um, yeah, that would be great, yeah. Yeah. Well, a couple of minutes left, allow me to ask you about um, the Contemporary Ukrainian Music Festival uh, 2021. Uh, any idea how that, how's that shaping up? Okay, so um, we're just revamping the website now in preparation of making kind of the announcement of all the performers and themes and music. Um, we do have venues booked in New York. Um, we're hoping to be able to perform in person at the Domena Center, which is a great contemporary music uh, location and also the Kaufman Center. Um, obviously, if necessary, we will do some kind of live stream hybrid something, um, but we are committed to, to moving forward and having something happen this year because we felt like it was really successful and there was a lot of interest last year. Um, the themes that we're looking at are um, Ukrainian electric acoustic music, and we're hoping very much to bring Ala Zahaykevich to New York to speak about electronic music in Ukraine and also to perform some works, which would be really exciting. Um, we're also going to do a concert devoted to the Shistostyabniki, um, the Kiev avant-garde school, um, and that we're very lucky to have the collaboration of the Talia Ensemble, which is a really um, impressive new music ensemble in New York, um, great interpreters of music of this time period. Um, that also is gonna coincide with um, an interview with Lenin Trabovsky and um, some other things sort of around um, a discussion of the Kiev Guard, which has been gaining some steam in, in English language sort of circles. Um, and then finally, we're doing a program of kind of the youngest generation of Ukrainian composers, which we're calling Voices of the New Millennium. So it's things that have all been written since 2000, um, some of whose composers were probably five years old in 2000. Um, and just kind of taking a sampling of what are the youngest um, members of the Ukrainian contemporary music scene doing. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm really excited about the program and I really hope that it will be possible to do it in person because I think that that's live music. Music in person is always better than Zoom. <laughs> um, but if necessary, we will we'll do some kind of um, hybrid or live streamed event. Uh, but things are things are moving ahead. And like I said, we'll, we'll be announcing sort of specific performers and pieces that are gonna be performed on the website very shortly. I'm just in the process of revamping um, some of the details. And we're shooting for February again, or? Oh, good question. It's March 5th through the 7th. It's that Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, so we were right at the end of February last year. Mm -hmm. We're just gonna push it back a tiny bit. 
after. And hope that. By some time, yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll certainly look forward to that and uh, and uh, and your Spotify playlist and uh, your continued research uh, in Ukraine and in Vienna. Uh, we look forward to having you report back on what you've uh, found there. Uh, thank you so much for your wonderful talk. Uh, it was very exciting. I'm glad we were able to hear this. Uh, and like I said earlier, it's a beautiful uh, kind of double header to next week's talk at this time by Miroslav Shkandri, where he'll be focusing on visual art uh, of this similar period. So thank you again, Leah, and I wish yeah. you much success in your future endeavors. Thanks. Thanks for having Thank me. Thank you everyone for, for tuning in today. See you next week.